So John Ashkar is going to talk about, so we're going to continue on this theme of um, prone lateral, and um, John's going to talk about um, how uh, uh, to use potentially robotics um, to do prone lateral. Uh, mine will be specifically over navigation. Navigation. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, my conversation will be over navigation and prolateral. And ultimately, you know, all this comes down to what your indications are, which is the why we do this surgery. Um, your technical considerations, just kind of understanding how to do it in an efficient way. And then the learning curve, right? Like that's really important to you guys, right? Like if you're taking this on, how easy is it for you to do it? And how easy is it for you to be able to safely create a safe result? You know, and, and Juan very eloquently spoke about the ease or the advantages of the prolateral. It's easy access posterior and lateral. So if you have locked facets posteriorly, if you've had posterior work or revision work, it's, it's really ideal in that situation. It's great for direct and indirect decompression. Uh, it's for me, I'm, I'm not as uh, talented as some, so I like putting my screws in prone. Uh, and then gravity is your friend. And just like uh, Bob Hart was talking about, I can add a PCO or a posterior column osteotomy or a Smith osteotomy. And effectively, if I do that at two levels, I can effectively create the same amount of correction I would for a, a PSL. So 30 degrees of correction. Right, and so so I can use this as a really phenomenal way to safely reconstruct the sagittal plane without having to do something that is as destabilizing or morbid as a uh, a, a pelvical subtraction osteotomy. Again, the pitfalls of prolateral are always going to be the learning curve, right? Just how easy is it? Everybody worries about the ergonomics, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the surgical outcomes, and I'll start going over some of that data, at least from my experience, and surgeon inertia, right? So we all have all seen this curve, right? And right now, um, you know, everybody here tends to be an early adopter, um, and we're approaching this chasm, and how do we overcome this chasm? And that's really what's going to take it to the next level. And kind of Juan outlined that very nicely. So what will take this to the next level? What will cross that chasm? And for me, the idea of, uh, sorry, uh, navigation is the uh, part that's going to cross that chasm. And so why navigate interbodies, right? It's safer for the patient. It's safer for your staff. It's safer for you. The ergonomics actually end up being better, and the reliability of workflow, right? So historically, we've all, you know, the, the, the classical thing with navigation was it was slower, but we were only putting in three or four or four screws on a single level T lift. Now my whole workflow is integrated into, into navigation. So my T lift or my prolateral is actually more efficient, less uh, fewer for radiation uh, exposure to radiation than a, a traditional T lift. Um, so for me, the, it just makes sense. The best example I can give that is my senior emeritus level partner is Harry Shuffleburger, right? He's never navigated this group before 2018. Now the, he thinks it's the standard of care. So you're talking about somebody who um, has been set in his ways, has been doing it for a while, but finds that, uh, has found that navigation is the next evolution and step. And I think, you know, the proof of concept with screws, screws are, require a high level of accuracy. I think inner bodies are the next jump on this, and I would, I'm really a big fan of it, at least in my practice. Um, as we know, with technical considerations, uh, the uh, prolateral is lordogenic. Uh, and what that does is it really starts to thicken out the flanks, so the retractor size is added by two centimeters. So, so if you're going to use a 10 millimeter or 10 centimeter or 100 centimeter retractor, you're going to use a uh, 120 if you're going lateral. Uh, we know from the work that Dr. Pimenta has performed and things that, that positioning prone um, really adds a fair amount of lordosis to the spine. So we're using that lordosis to really be able to help us. Okay. Um, it helps position the, and this is some debate around this, uh, repositioning of the femoral nerve. And then the other thing with navigation, though, and this is really important, is navigation is not only about the bone. Oops, sorry. I look up there. 
Navigation is not only about the bone, but it's also about what we can see in the soft tissue. So now, not only am I using neuromonitoring, but I am also using the navigation to identify the plexus, uh, which usually sits here and you see a nice little flat plane there. You see the psoas and you see the borders and you see the, the vessels. And especially when you start getting to a scoliotic or really deformed spine, um, you know where all of your anatomy is. So, so I'm using the navigation not for the bony work a lot of times, but I'm using it for the soft tissue work, right? And being able to get into the soft tissue uh, well. And like you can see it even here, it doesn't show as well, unfortunately, on the screen, but you can see the psoas, I'm taking a little bit more of an anti-psoas approach to it and still being able to, to do the work. And I'm doing that under, under navigation. I'm helping, the navigation is an extra set of eyes for me and there's no fluoro in, it, in the room, at the, or not in the room, but it, um, in the patient at the time. Again, so, so my workflow becomes really easy. I'm not really worrying about fluoro. I'm looking across and I'm able to, to go pre-psoas, trans-psoas, uh, whenever I need to, depending on what the anatomy allows. I know when I'm coming out on the contralateral side. I know where the vessels, especially when you have degenerative deformity, that can be really important on the contralateral side. And Here's a video, and I'll go ahead and get it started. But just kind of the workflow, right? So, so here I use it just, I have four images up. I'm gonna go actually back for one second. So I have four images up. Sorry, I'm having trouble with this. I always have four images up when I use navigation. I have the, the axial CT, I have the coronal CT, but I also have a synthetic and AP and a synthetic lateral up at all times. Okay, it's an extra set of orientation for me, so I'm not driving or ending up in the end plate. So all of these four images are always up for me when I utilize the navigation, and it really does a good job of protecting you. Here's the video. I plan out the incision just like I normally do. Here it is. Um, and this is actually a fairly big patient. I'm working at L4-5, coming in, doing my blunt dissection, just going kind of through the skin right there. And I, I treat this like I treat a normal x left or a, a normal lateral. Blunt dissection all the way in, fall into the retroperitoneal space. This, and she's a pretty big person. You'll see she sucks up the whole uh, uh, pin. Now, this is my whoopee. It's my security blanket, right? I'm always using that to kind of ensure that I'm going in the right trajectory. I don't like K-wires with navigation, so I have a solid shank dilator that goes into the disk space. You can see me go into the disk space right there. And I'll mount that in. I put the top hat back on. And what that does is it confirms my position. And that's exactly what we have. I'll put the dilators in. She sucks them all up. Uh, just, but you know, like again, I, I use all the tools I have. I'm using the electrophysiologic monitoring. There's no fluoro there. Double check everything. And then, sorry, just move a little bit slow. But this is, again, I'm lining up the, uh, the retractor just like you would for an exif along the line with the desk place. Lock it into place. And now it just becomes a traditional x left or a lateral operation. Very simple. Now, kind of coming back to it, though, once I'm, I've done it and I'm putting the light sources in, pass, jump past some of this. Sorry. Make this speed up. Here, I'm navigating my 
um, uh, trialing and my or my my uh, cob. Know exactly what it is. I, I use the the images to line it up. All four images, and once I'm in, I just kind of mallet everything in place. Do my discectomy. And again, it's harder to make out here, but you'll, you'll see I have a little bit of a front-to-back trajectory. I'm actually pulling the psoas back and working in a little bit of that pre-psoas space there. Because I can see it under direct, or I can see it under the navigation. All the instruments are navigated, so I'm using a navigated curette, feeling out the end plates. When I use a navigated curette, I use it kind of in a way where I'm, I block off the end plates into four areas, one quadrant one, two, three, and four, and I want to be able to paintbrush each one of those really, really well, and it gives me another sense of me making sure that I've done a good job of preparing the end plates. Here I go in with the inner body. I always do this part under fluoro, when, or the, the trialing, make sure that I'm happy with my PA and lateral, and then um, go ahead and work on putting my final implant in. And in these cases, oftentimes I'll uh, end up doing a posterior column osteotomy or releasing the facets posteriorly, so a lot of times you'll see a mini open incision posteriorly. Most of my cases end up being revisions. Here's some other cases. Here's a great example of one where um, this patient had a, uh, a, a coflex, vertiflex, whatever these devices are, um, has a high grade or a grade two spondy, significant collapse, um, a lot of dural scarring. He had a she had a CSF leak. So going back in posteriorly to take all this stuff out and then trying to do a T lift through that is not a fun operation. So this is one where I I'll tell you that navigation is a navigated uh, pro is a fantastic operation to be able to kind of go in. I'm um, oh, sorry, hit the wrong button. And uh, do it all posteriorly. Um, it's a great job, like we talked about, for restoring sagittal profile. And my interoperative learning curve, you know, what we've had is that um, this is from, I presented at Esmus, but 94 levels in 58 patients. Um, now I have like over 140 levels. Um, and here's my divided into time. My mean retractor time has uh, been about 17 minutes. That's really for a number of reasons. I have a high, so I do revisions, T-lift revisions. And so, so a lot of times uh, my I have to dichotomize between my retractor time for a primary case for a revision. That's not done here. But we found no difference uh, in the group. Our, I have had one ALL rupture that did require plating. And then one quad weakness in a revision case, which was actually a congenital revision, which was not a pleasant case. She went on to re recover well, but it was, uh, that was probably a patient selection issue more than a, uh, a technical issue. Um, again, to take that to the next level, we were just talking about the, the uh, corpectomy. This is one where, where the patient has an infected uh, 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 kyphoplasty uh, with significant uh, collapse. The original stance, she has had multiple previous surgery. We were able to go in and uh, remove the, through a prone position, remove the, the uh, uh, cement, go in and do a uh, uh, corpectomy, and then if, just because of her severe osteoporosis, we ended up taking it to the sacrum. Um, for me, it's an effective way to, to approach the patient. Using gravity and positioning really helps, and I really think the, to overcome some of the issues that we have, navigation is probably the most distinguishing part of it, and so it's an important part of it, the way I, I approach these cases. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. John, so because the, the talk was titled um, it was prone lateral for deform navigated prone lateral for deformity. So yep. I think the so it's more you can address deformity in a focal means. 
meaning like you're doing one or one level. The, re the reason I haven't I haven't incorporated a lot of navigation myself is because it's such a powerful procedure. The minute the inner body goes in, the reference CT is no longer valuable. And I feel like you'd have to re-image every single time to so, put an inner body graph. So, so I, I actually do it the other way around. So I use modular screws. And so what I do is my workflow is screws first, right? Because the screws require the most accuracy. Um, and then what I do is um, I usually f uh, use the reference frame off of the spine. So I've got a number of T10 of the pelvis um, cases where I can show you. And effectively, I'll put the frame on, say, like L3 or L4, right? And if I need to get 30 degrees of correction, what I'll do is I'll put all my screws in. I'll do a, a Smith Pete at L3, uh, 4, and 4, 5, or L2, 3, and 3, 4. And then I will do my inner bodies uh, there, and I'm able to get... Uh, do because the the reference frame is, frame is on the spinous process of say L3, um, it stays true. So L3 is always going to be my reference point. So if I do an inner body at L3 4 and then do what do one at L2 3, I'm always referencing off of L3 because that's where the frame is attached. So you can do multiple levels that way and not have to do a respin, and it stays very, very accurate. But the work workflow has to be screws first, so modular screws first, whatever type of screws you want first, um, and then you do your inner bodies and releases that way. And if you do it that way, you're able to do um, all of it w within one, maybe two spins. That's a really important point. Thank you. Perfect. Again, very good talk. Congratulations. Uh, I have the, my, my problem to understand uh, navigation uh, in prone position is I understand that your reference, your, your bolts, your screws, uh, you do first because it's precise. Right. Navigation is made for precision. Uh, and we know that in prone position, uh, with taping, you have more movements with a patient, right? How these affect precision in lateral? So it's a good question. So what I usually do is early on, what I did was, and it's, uh, I think uh, Juan does the same, is I always keep the CR min. And so I never trial. So uh, most of the floral shots we take are related to retractor position. Right, and so the this, the the navigation is great for retractor position, but once the trials go in and once the cages go in, I think that needs to be done under. And this is a very good point that needs to be done under fluoro to ensure appropriate position. So the retractors and all of that pre work up until the retractors are done under navigation, and then the implant itself and the trials always done under fluoro because remember the fluoro doesn't change and so that's where the accuracy starts to wait. 